Hello students, um, welcome again to the third chapter of insurance law. The last two classes we learned about what is this insurance um, in the general perspective and of course we linked it to law as well and we also learned about the types of insurance and the different case laws that revolved around the concept of insurance. Today we are going to learn about insurable interest. I'm repeating, it is insurable interest. Now, what is this insurable interest? Insurable interest is a very important concept in the field of insurance and also in insurance law. It is the sequinon, so to say it is something that has to be there while issuing an insurance policy, as well as while determining the claim. As we learned during the last class, we said that insurance policy is normally evaluated by a team of underwriters who study the possibility of uh, issuing a policy as well as the possibility of honoring a claim. Uh, insurance claim. So today we are going to learn about the concept of insurable interest, which is a bedrock concept, a significant concept, and it is a concept that is prevalent in insurance in order to issue an insurance policy, the underwriters or the insurance company will, will search for this concept, will infer the presence of this concept, whether at all it is there for the possibility of issuing an insurance policy, as well as towards the end for the purpose of honoring any claim from the insurance policy holder. Therefore, it is a sequinon, it is an essential element, it is a significant factor that needs to be examined while issuing insurance policy, as well as while, you know, honoring the claim of an insurance policy holder. Let us go to our slides now. Now, as a slide say, just concentrate here a bit. Uh, insurable interest is an essential element or a sequinon in the contract of insurance. That means it cannot be done without. It's an, you know, an essential element to be considered you know, valid apart from the general elements in the elements of, in the, you know, among the elements of contract. If you have studied the law of contract, you must have studied the essential elements of the law of contract, like there has to be an offer, there has to be an acceptance, and then there has to be you know, the legal enforceability part of it, and the legal enforceability comprises of consideration and, uh, you know, capacity to contract and the uh, intention to contract, purpose of the contract, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So in insurance contracts, the sequinon or an elementary factor or a clause that is going to be there is insurable interest. The fundamental principle that revolves around insurance contract is a principle of insurable interest and this interest specifically is pertaining to the subject matter of the insurance. That means it implies that a specific person, body or a corporate must have some interest in the subject matter of insurance. For example, the car owner who invests in an auto insurance is said to have a direct insurable interest in the vehicle. I'm repeating again. The car owner who invests in an auto insurance is said to have a direct insurable interest in the vehicle. Therefore, to have an insurable interest in something would mean that the person seeking the insurance policy would suffer a loss 
So that is something that we are going to examine, whether when the loss occurs or the, even that they seek to ensure when that, that possible event or the probable event occurs, possible or probable event occurs, whether at all the person who's seeking the insurance policy would be put in a bad situation, would suffer a loss. So, and if that injured person or property were to be harmed, lost, damaged. So furthermore, the person would receive some financial benefit from the insured person or person's continued existence. So there are two things there. One is to make good the loss, or to compensate. In some kinds of insurance, you could also use the term to indemnify the loss, okay, for the loss occurred. Now, why I'm saying in some kinds of insurance, you already learned during the last class, there are different types of insurance. And in what type of insurance, the indemnity factor is reflected. I'm sure you remember that. So therefore, insurable interest is something where uh, it, it, it is a concept that would be examined by the underwriters whether to, to study the nexus or the relationship between the person who sought the insurance policy and the subject matter of insurance, as well as even the beneficiaries who are listed there. And if the person uh, you know, loses that sub the, the subject of insurance, whether at all the person or the beneficiary would be put in a um, you know, would be uh, who's, uh, whether they would their life or the situation would be jeopardized, or there would be some harm to that person. So basically, to to you know, conclude on the existence of insurable interest, the relationship between the policy holder, the person seeking the policy, and the subject matter of insurance would be taken into consideration. And also the beneficiaries listed in the insurance contract would also be examined. But here it is not necessary as uh, we have, uh, you know, cited an example just before this about the car owner who invested in an auto insurance. And we said that he could be considered as having a direct insurable interest in the vehicle. Now, it's not necessary always that it's only the, the owner of a property who might have an insurable interest. What is necessary is, what is required to be examined is the nexus or the relationship between the person seeking the insurance policy or the claim and the loss that occurs or the probable event or the possible event that has been, you know, that is, uh, has been uh, sought to be covered under the insurance policy. And if that event occurs, whether this person would be put in, uh, you know, in a condition of, you know, where he is at absolute loss or some harm has caused to him. Are you understanding me? So therefore, insurable interest is nothing but a significant factor and a significant element that has to exist in an insurance contract or in an insurance policy at the time of seeking the insurance policy, the underwriters would examine this factor. And it has to be in an insurance contract so that at the time of claim, they would examine this concept that is the prevalence or the existence of this concept insurable interest, whether the person who is seeking an insurance policy or she seeking the benefits of the insurance policy, whether this insurable interest exists or not. Therefore, this insurable interest in the contract law perspective must be capable of legally enforced. So you see here, you're seeing two elements. One is the relationship of the party with the insured uh, subject matter, and two, that it has to be capable of being enforced in the court of law or enforced, uh, you know, in the sense it should be capable of being honored by the insurance company and the right should be capable of being enforced. Now, inferring on the insurable interest 
in an application for insurance or a claim helps in one prevention of random issue of insurance. That is, you know, just randomly issuing of insurance uh, policies and prevention of speculation of risks involved. So the definition that is given by Collins Dictionary of Law on insurable interest is that the person has such an interest in the property or in the life of a person, if damage or destruction of property or death of a person would expose him to the pecuniary loss or liability. That means it would expose a person to a financial loss or a financial liability as per Collins Dictionary of Law. So insurable interest is therefore an integral part of insurance contract. So insurance is inferred or concluded bearing in mind a certain amount of risk to the individual. That is whether at all there is um, you know, palpable risk or you know, an exposure of maximum risk to the individual seeking the insurance policy and subject matter of the insurance policy. Now, this is evaluated during the underwriting process to ensure the direct nexus or the direct relationship. What would be examined here is the person would uh, uh, the person who would be exposed to the laws of financial laws in case of some harm that may be caused to the subject matter of insurance. Now, insurance interest or insurable interest can also be deciphered among examining upon examining the nexus between the insured and the event, as well as the subject matter involved, as we said earlier, and assume and then the assume the occurrence of the event to calculatively ascertain the substantial loss or the injury that may be caused to the insured in case of loss or harm caused to the subject matter of insurance. Now, an owner of goodwill prima facie, that means on the face of it, as you see it directly, has an insurable interest in the goods of property insured. However, the property or the ownership may change with the passage of time. I'm sure you'll agree with me on that during the subsistence of the insurance contract, because sometimes it can be a devolution of property. Property may be transferred from one person to another. In example, there is a property X and that property is covered in the fire insurance. And later on, property X is, uh, you know, the owner of X is A and A dies and property devolves to B, A son, or uh, A uh, is still alive and A decides to sell the property to someone else. So the property remains the same. The fire insurance is there. The subject matter is the same, but the, there is devolution of that particular property. So now who has an insurable interest? The person who has died and the person who is uh, at present the owner of the property is a question. So I'm sure you know the answer, right? So there has to be an insurable interest. Uh, there has to be a nexus or a relationship between the subject matter that is a property here and the, the policy holder. So therefore, with the passage of time, during the subsistence or the existence of the insurance contract, sometimes it might happen that the ownership may pass to another person or may be transferred to another person. So in such an event, it gets relatively cumbersome to pinpoint who the owner of the goods is at the time of loss or claim. You know, sometimes it might get a little bit difficult for the underwriters and they might ask you for, you know, several, uh, you know, evidential proof or uh, evidential records to prove that what is the relationship between the policy holder and the one who's seeking the benefits of the policy in case the, uh, of, uh, you know, the policy holder dies or in case of the death of the policy holder, then there's, uh, you know, sometimes it gets relatively cumbersome to pinpoint who is the owner of goods at the time of loss or claim, or, or who has this insurable interest when the you know the problem occurs or the event occurs? So now here a great deal hinges upon any subsequent contract pertaining to sale or even demolition of property, and therefore it is advisable that insurance contracts also should be carefully drafted. And while taking the insurance policy, the policyholder has to carefully go through the terms and conditions and see that it is you know, in a way that it is beneficial to the policyholder as well. And what the policyholder has in mind, the policyholder has also to go through the, the insurance policy terms and conditions and in case of subsequent contract, go through the terms of the contract. However, in insurance policy, there are certain terms that cannot be done without. That means you will have to follow the terms and conditions which are, which are legally required to be followed and which also as part of the insurance uh, you know, company, which is normally, uh, you know, enumerated in uh, terms in the terms and conditions of an insurance policy in alignment with the law, and that cannot be done without. And normally, there can be no amendments to that effect. However, in case there is a possible clause that could be amended 
uh, like for example, like who would be the beneficiary and so on. So the insurance policy holder or the one who's seeking the insurance policy is normally advised that they should be careful while uh, you know they they take the insurance policy uh, uh, and see that the you know the 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 clauses are clear enough. Certain clauses are clear enough, and uh, they can you know that would really not uh, jeopardize the rights of the other person in whose favor they might want to transfer the insurable interest after the death. So therefore now let's go back to a slide and see that insurable interest is that thus at the heart of an insurance policy. So therefore we say that insurance in, insurable interest, the interest in the insurance is a heart of all insurance policies connecting the insured and the owner of the policy. So insurable interest can be an object, it can be a person, which if damaged or destroyed expires or expires would result in the financial hardship or a pecuniary hardship for the one contracting the policy or the policy holder. Now there is a very interesting case and it's a landmark decision which has to be there in your answers for insurable interest, there is Justice Lawrence J. in Lucina versus Crawford. Here in this case, Justice Lawrence observed in this case, and he went on to actually, uh, you know, examine the concept of insurable interest, and he, he, he observed, and in the pursuit of advising the other judges that the lordships in the case, he said that, a man is interested in a thing to whom advantage may arise or prejudice happens from the circumstances which may attend to it, and whom it imports that its condition as to safety or other quality should continue. Interest that on, does not necessarily imply a right to the whole or part of the thing or necessarily and exclusively that which may be the subject of privation, but that of having some relationship to or concerning the subject of the insurance, which relation or concern by the happening of the perils insured against may be so affected as to produce a damage or detriment or prejudice to the person insuring. So they are saying that insurable interest could be examined by looking for the concept or looking for who is, you know, really going to be exposed to the risk and to whom detriment would be caused or to whom damage would be caused. And whether at all there would be prejudice to the person who is insuring or who's seeking the insurance policy. And when a man is so circumstantial stance with respect to matters exposed to certain risks or dangers as to have moral certainty of advantage or benefit, but for those risks or dangers, he may be said to be interested in the safety of the thing. To be interested in the preservation of a thing is to be so circumstanced with respect to it as to have benefit from its existence, prejudice from its destruction. The property of a thing and the interest divisible from it may be very different on the first the price is generally the measure, but by the interest in the thing, every benefit and advantage arising out of or depending on such thing may be comprehended. There is yet another interesting case which will make the concept of insurable interest more clearer. That is uh, Minster Insurance Company Limited and E.C. Parker and Company Limited, Moonacre. This was with respect to a yacht, Moon Acre. Insurance policy was taken for a motor yacht, Moon Acre, which was belonging to, it's not belong there, which was belonging to one Mr. Sharp. But for the purpose of tax, a company called Rora Investments in Gibraltar was registered as the owner of Moon Acre. Mr. Sharp was the given power of attorney by the registered company to sail and manage the vessel. And he was also named as the assured in the contract of insurance. During the policy, whilst the single crewman employed on board, Munaika was aware the yacht caught fire at her moorings and became a constructive total loss. Now you see here, the owner was uh, on paper, on record, was another company at Gibraltar, that is Rora Investments. And there was another contract, that is, where Mr. Sharp was given the, the authority to sail and manage the vessel. So Moonacre was away, and the yacht caught fire at her moorings and became a, a constructive total loss. 
when the assured Mr. Sharp sought to recover and claim the policy, the insurers, MIC, that is a Mr. Insurance Company, declined payment on the grounds inter alia that Mr. Sharp did not possess any insurable interest in Moonaka because the owner on record was actually Rohr invest Investments in Gibraltar. But here the court said that Mr. Sharp, in fact, did have an insurable interest in the yacht because it's not necessarily always ownership, but also whose who's position is shaken on the happening of a particular event and to whom loss or harm is caused, apart from the owner, of course. So then they said that Mr. Sharp indeed did have an insurable interest in the Moon Acre yacht. Now, for an insurable interest to exist is not always that ownership that matters, but what matters is the actual link or the nexus or the relationship between the insured and the risk insured against. In Berto Camillary versus Harold Bartley, the court held that for insurable interest to exist, it is not absolute ownership which is required, but the existence of a relationship between the person insured and the thing which could be adversely affected by the happening of the risk insured against. So I'm repeating here again because this is a very important concept because you must understand insurable interest because it's a significant factor in an insurance contract or also to you know, avoid uh, a claim under the insurance contract also at the time of purchasing an insurance policy. So therefore, insurable interest has to exist. It is basically a relationship between the person insured and the subject matter of insurance, a thing which could be adversely affected by the happening of a particular event or the risk uh, or the risk insured against. So it's not necessarily that has to be an ownership there, but the relationship that who, whose condition is jeopardized on the happening of a particular event. So, well, this is an interesting case there, Bertu Camillary versus, Camillary, sorry, Bertu Camillary at O versus Harold Bartley, 2003. Now, let's examine the insurance insurable interest in a life insurance policy. We learned last class what is life insurance. We also studied different factors that revolve around the life insurance policy and who can seek a life insurance policy. Today we'll learn the factor of insurable interest that revolves around specifically life insurance policy as well. In a life insurance policy, the factor of insurable interest will be determined at the time of purchase of the policy. I want you to pay attention here because insurable interest in a life insurance policy, it is distinct from the insurable interest in a, you know, an insurance, insurance policy that seeks to cover property or property insurance policy. Now here in life insurance policy, the one who seeks the policy or contracts the policy must have an insurable interest in the life of the insured. In case the person contracting the policy is not the beneficiary, you know that in a life insurance policy, you might have even beneficiaries listed in the particular insurance policy. So in case it does not have a beneficiary, beneficiary, then the beneficiary name in the contract will have to express the nexus or the relationship between the purchaser of the policy and the beneficiary to evidence or to prove the insurable interest that upon the demise of the insured, the surviving person named in would be exposed to a loss. So it has to prove who has the insurable interest in case of demise of the policy holder. And in case of life insurance, the falling person could be considered to have an insurable interest. One of course, that is the one who purchases the policy that is the one probably he is insuring his own life or own self. And second is the direct dependence by blood or marriage of spouse, children, grandchildren, adopted children. Now, they could be an insurable interest even uh, for the parents in case the person has no one existing. That is, he has no progeny, he has no spouse. Next is an insurance, a life insurance policy could also be sought in the name of aged parents. But the thing here is the, the consent of the aged parents has to be sought and, you know, they, has to, uh, they have to willingly sign the insurance contract. So normally, life insurance, the falling persons would be considered to have insurable interest. That is a person who's purchasing the insurance policy for one's own self or for his own life. And second is a direct dependence by blood, marriage, spouse, children, grandchildren, including adopted children. 
Now, insurable interest does not exist in case of separate, uh, in case of step parents, uncles, aunties, cousins, neighbors, etc. Obviously, not neighbors. So, on continued existence. Bartolo would turn a limited was middle C insurance 2007 case here the court observed that an insurable interest exists where the insured may be said to be benefit from the continued existence of the property or life insured and will suffer a loss by reason of its damage or destruction. Again, giving an example of key man life insurance or business life insurance, because every business might have a key person. And in case that person dies, it might jeopardize the affairs of the company or the business. So certain businesses may, may seek or secure a key man life insurance policy where the person who is insured may be regarded as a key person or you know sometimes even the c-suit officers that is the highest level managing directors or maybe you know the ceo of the company the c-suit officers sometimes companies may uh, you know secure an insurance policy in their favor and it would come under the ambit of key man life insurance policy also on a business life insurance therefore a business may have an insurable interest in the c-suit officers so creditors, now moving on to the creditor companies, like who provide loans and so on. So creditor companies or banks, loaning institutions may secure the debtors with a life insurance policy with the absolute consent from some debtors and the policy sought will be equal to the amount owed. Now, what is the nature of insurable interest? I, we have discussed so far, what is insurable interest itself? From there, you will, you should be able to really extract the nature of insurable interest or you know discern and understand and decipher and conclude on what is the nature of insurable interest even without looking at the slide i'm sure you would say that insurable interest is a significant factor in a insurance policy and the the type of insurable interest would vary with the type of insurance policy and next would be that insurance policy should be capable of being enforced, as we studied in the first or the second slide. It should be capable of being legally enforced. Of course, that means if it has to be legally enforced, it should not be you know, unlawful. It should not be illegal. For example, person who is dealing with drugs cannot go and say that I want to insure this drugs because it might be lost in transit. So one cannot really insure drugs because it's against the law. It's illegal transaction and now again for securing the illegal transaction a person the, 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 the underwriters cannot really sit and examine whether there is an insurable interest here so therefore it affects even the concept of insurable interest insurable interest therefore must be capable of being legally enforced it must be lawful not illegal not against public policy and as the slide says, insurance interest must not be opposed to public policy. It must be, be capable of calculating it in pecuniary terms, that is, in financial terms. Sentimental factors or love and affection cannot be construed as insurable interest. Someone says that, no, I was in love with a person, but the person got married to someone else and he had a life insurance policy. So the person who was a mistress cannot come and say, no, he loved me. And so the wife, you know, she is... Uh, you know, she cannot uh, really have an insurable interest. And so the life insurance policy should do all in her favor. She, could, she cannot say that. So sentimental factors or love and affection cannot be construed as an insurable interest or as a party having an insurable interest. The relationship between the insurer, the subject matter and the policy holder here is examined and not the ownership. Next is a factor of insurable interest, of course, varies with the type of insurance. As I said earlier, while we're you know, like, you know, studying the life insurance policy there. Now, insurance interest may be, insurable interest may be present at the time of taking the policy, but may frizzle out subsequently, as in life insurance policy. That means it can shift, it can change. It can frizzle out from one particular person and it can shift to some other person. Therefore, contractual provision to that extent must be secured as to the existence of the time of securing the policy and to be interpreted as that it may or may not exist at the time of the claim. Example, where a husband may secure a life insurance policy of his wife and then after some years he divorces and then she dies. So the husband will still be able to claim. In Griffith versus Fleming, CA 4 March, 1909, 1909. 
Griffith and his wife each signed a proposal form for a joint life policy on their lives for five pounds and both contributed towards the premium. After the policy was taken, the wife committed suicide and the husband claimed the sum insured. The insurer alleged that at the time of taking the policy, the husband had no insurable interest. So in his wife's life, as required by the Life Insurance Act 1774, the court, Wogan Williams, and there, there was a judge, Wogan Williams, Justice Wogan Williams, he held that the husband has an interest in his wife's life, which ought to be presumed. And that is unnecessary to go into the evidence to show that a pecuniary or a financial interest exists with respect to the husband. So this is Griffith versus Fleming for MARCA. Next is in property insurance, marine insurance, insurable interest must exist at all times till the time of actual possession. That is, as he said, insurable interest may be passed on from, from one owner to another because there can be devolution of property or there can be sale of property, purchase of property and so on. So in property insurance, marine insurance, what matters is the possession, the actual possession, who holds the actual possession and the interest that might shift from one person to another. Therefore, insurable interest may exist at all times in the subject matter that is the property till the time of actual possession. This, so this is all with insurable interest. If you have any questions, you can ask me and uh, get ready for your assignments. It's already posted online in your Google Classroom. And um, there would be a negative marking in case of delay in submitting the assignments. That is minus one for each day of default. Thank you for learning with me and uh, God bless you. If you have any questions, you can certainly ask me. Bye-bye.